Let's uh, welcome Peter for our talk. Okay, so uh, this talk is titled The Secret Life of Pet Pods. Uh, it was originally titled after the uh, David Attenborough uh, documentary, uh, but I actually named it wrong because that would be named The, the Private Life of Plants. So this talk is laced with lots of pictures because I know it's the end of the evening and there's lots of pictures of David Amber because I just like the guy. Um, uh, I know the meetup said that I would be talking about uh, monitoring and stuff like that. Um, this talk was originally planned as an internal uh, presentation about for the developers on how to run your software in Kubernetes. So I'm actually going to be talking about uh, specific characteristics of uh, the pod primitive within Kubernetes and uh, what you need to know about that uh, from a developer perspective. Uh, so without further ado, yeah, there's some days of going uh, I'm Peter Lange, I've been working with Digidentity for a year now. Uh, they call me a DevOps engineer. Uh, I'm more of an ops guy myself, I think. Uh, made some uh, Docker projects on the GitHub, and feel free to take a look. And, uh oh, that's better. Uh, I've been working on new infrastructure for uh, Digital Identity, cloud native, and all that new jazz. Uh, doing automated dev environments within the container space with a, and um, yeah, just working on uh, containerization of the entire application uh, landscape as is, so that's my background here. Um, yeah, so I want to be talking about the uh, pod life cycle, so what it takes to build a pod, uh, how it's uh, actually booted but uh, at first I just want to talk about what a pod actually is for those who don't know. Who's actually worked with Kubernetes before? <laughs> just one. Who's a developer here? Oh, that's good. Any operations people here? Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. good. So, uh, I only have a very short piece about the uh, uh, CI, but Luckily, there was already an uh, extensive talk about it, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, I want to talk about how the pods are actually instantiated, uh, uh, how they actually run within the Kubernetes uh, space, how they die, and um, in the end, uh, I also want to talk about some uh, nice uh, deployment patterns that have evolved over the years. Uh, within other uh, companies that use these same primitives, <coughs> like Google. Uh, they actually written papers about this, so this is not an original idea or something. So, uh, what's a pod? Well, we're all very familiar with uh, the terms uh, uh, pets versus cattle, hence the rancher name. Um, basically, uh, we're talking about pods like they aren't pets. We should treat our applications like these things that can go up in smoke and you don't really need to twist uh, all the knobs and treat them really well and pet them and be kind to them. No, they, they come up and they go away. And so don't treat them like, as such. So, yeah. Within Kubernetes, within Kubernetes, you can sometimes make a pod a pet. Um, this is a very new feature. Um, it'll come up later. So, what is a pod within uh, Kubernetes? Um, we've been talking about uh, Rancher, uh, which can actually run uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, on top of it. Um, a pod is... Um, basically the smallest scalable unit within Kubernetes. So when you're talking about uh, container engines like Swarm, uh, Rancher, all of them, they all schedule like Docker containers. Uh, what a pod actually is within uh, Kubernetes is a 
com combination of multiple con containers um, that you can orchestrate to do cool things together. So you can actually run a pod with just a single container, uh, which is a fairly common uh, pattern, but uh, because you can actually can schedule multiple containers within the same pod and they, they uh, share some uh, some parts of the namespace, um, you can do some pretty uh, cool and powerful things. Uh, you, sh you should treat a pod as an ephemeral uh, uh, entity, so like I said, uh, cattle, uh, they, they come and they go away. And um, Yes, the namespace is basically, it sounds very exciting, but it's very simple. It's, uh, you can almost treat a pod like a VM, it's not, uh, but a pod, uh, containers within the same pod share the sh uh, shared memory, they share uh, volumes, so actual mount points on disk. Uh, they also share an IP address because uh, Kubernetes comes with an overlay network. Uh, wherein each pod gets its own IP address, so you can actually communicate between pods directly and then uh, route a port to a specific container in, within uh, the pod. So you, I'll have some examples uh, with pictures later <laughs> that can uh, illustrate this a little bit better. And uh, yeah, because they share uh, IP, they also have host name and so on. Am I losing anyone here? No. Right. So this is what a, this is the famous picture of uh, the Kubernetes pod. What you see here is um, the entire pod namespace um, with two. You can imagine them to be Docker containers, but actually within Kubernetes you don't really care if it's Docker or not. It can be Rocket. It can be. I think these are some of the leaders. The that are moving the moving force behind the whole Docker forking thing, because uh, yeah, you just need a stable uh, container engine uh, in order to to uh, to do this uh, yeah this container orchestrating stuff. So what you can do within this uh, this is a very simple example, but it will illustrate uh, quickly where the power within something like this is. So you can have a, a container that's very simple that's just pulling files into a, into a directory. This directory can be uh, some ephemeral storage on your node, so it's something that goes away again, and whenever your pod gets started up or on a, on a cycle or something, it syncs the, the files from a git repo or just some, some S3 bucket or what, what have you. It syncs it to a disk, and then uh, another container within the same pod has access to that uh, directory, and it can actually serve the files from there. So it can be a web server, it can be something else. But this makes it uh, for a very composable um, uh, yeah, entity. So uh, we're always talking about code reuse and, and so on. So uh, this kind of stuff um, really, for, for me, drives the whole uh, innovation within uh, container uh, landscape. So. Um, <coughs> Who's not familiar with the 12 vector app standards? Very quick show of hands. Okay, so I'll very quickly do this. There's a website. Please look it up whenever you're doing something within Docker um, or a container engine. Um, these basically set some guidelines on how to build containers that are uh, uh, Cloud native, really cloud <coughs> native. Like um, they specify how you should build your containers, how you uh, log uh, 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 stuff like that. Um, uh, this is actually a link. The slides will be up later. Uh, you can click it, but you can also really easily find it. It's like 12factor.net or something. So, so this is what a Kubernetes cluster sort of looks like, and. Um, yeah, so you can actually not really see this. You have a Kubernetes master and you have a node and then you have the Docker engine here and then this is the pod. So a Docker container is like this 
really a small entity, but this is the entire entity that gets scheduled within your uh, uh, orchestration software. Um, so if you're looking at this from a, a Docker perspective, you're this tiny thing here, and then there's the power around it. So, onto the actual life cycle. Uh, so you, you'd have your build server, uh, the thing that actually builds your containers. Uh, or the entire build cycle. Um, yeah, we already had a talk, so I'll quickly go through this. Uh, you do your push, you run your tests, you do a start your Docker build, artifact push. Uh, then you'd have some kind of uh, deployment measure, like Rancher, that would do automatically deploy the application to your development environment or whatever kind of canary environment you'd have, and then you. Uh, as a, a classically schooled operations guy, I still do not really feel comfortable uh, about automatically pushing to production. So, yes, I, I'd really rather have some human do this. So. <coughs> and that's all for the CI stuff, because uh, luckily we already talked about this. Um, if you want to know more, then uh, come talk to, uh, talk to us later. In, uh, so, uh, container birth. Um, this is actually um, the, the, the deployment phase. Uh, yeah, this is how it would traditionally be done. Um, so, pods are actually this ephemeral thing. If you schedule your pod um, and your node dies, the pod dies and it won't get automatically rescheduled if you just deploy the pod, or if you just made the entity manually. So, in order to deal with this, you'd have uh, something that actually reschedule the pod onto your cluster. Um, the, the first instantiation of, of something like this would be the replication controller. Uh, right now in beta, but it's actually quite stable. You can use deployments, which uh, in turn create replica sets, in the replica sets, you can scale up to, uh, to, to say how many uh, uh, instances of your, your containers you want. Um, and it's also because you have this uh, very primitive um, uh, level of, of uh, resources, you can imagine that the drawbacks would be very easy because you just, um, you'd still have your old replica set, but it would just be set to zero replicas. And if you want to do a rollback, you just up the replicas to uh, whatever number of replicas you'd have and set a new one to zero or just delete it. Uh, something fairly new is jobs. So these are pods that are actually allowed to die. Uh, they, they do a job, they finish it uh, successfully, they can die. If they finish it successfully, they get scheduled again. Um, you have daemon sets. These are pods that are actually scheduled on every node in your cluster. This is very useful for like uh, uh, central login collection or uh, monitoring, that, that kind of stuff. Something you'd have to run on every node. Uh, Kubernetes has now the uh, node problem detector. Very useful thing. It does all kinds of monitoring which Kubernetes itself doesn't do yet. So it would actually talk to the Kubernetes master and deschedule the node. It's nice stuff. Uh, and lastly, the pet set. So this is something I mentioned briefly in the beginning. Uh, normally you'd have these, these containers that are uh, ephemeral and they go away. And you wouldn't have really have a lot of static information in this. Um, but that would re make it really hard to run something like Pongo, which would expect um, like stable host names, or stable uh, stable environment things, and uh, within uh, something like Docker, your, your host name always changes, so that's really annoying. Petset is really half alpha feature, but yeah, this stuff is moving really, really fast. I'm not here to talk about Kubernetes in general, just about the pod stuff. Um, this is um, this is how you run containers in production, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Is it already? Is there also already uh, scheduled for some feature for a version? Uh, so the way that's it. Th uh, the way the release model for uh, Kubernetes works is that they 
right now we're on version 1.4. So yeah. in, in these point releases, they release something in alpha, then they wait and see what kind of problems people have, and then they go to beta, of course, but that would also actually change the API endpoint. So you actually have to code uh, for the beta endpoints to, uh, to do that. So normally they have like these three months release cycles, so it takes about a half a year for something to become stable, which is, yeah. I think, pretty fast. Okay. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the most simple uh, uh, definition of a pod within Kubernetes, and I hope this is readable for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, did I have something, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into the API, but this is basically how you run your container. Uh, you'd have your, your image name, uh, a name of the container within the pod. Remember, you can have multiple containers within the same pod. Uh, and a command to run. So th this is simple. Um, but like I said, this thing is, if it's scheduled and the node goes away, the pod is gone. It, it won't get rescheduled. So what, what the replication controller uh, and stuff like that is doing it's really simple. It's just a temp all these things are just templating engines around the pod, right? It's and I like simple as a ops guy uh, because I can reason about it. Uh, even this guy. So, um, yeah, this is an example of the uh, replication controller for the previous pod. Um, this thing is just running three replicas of the. Of the of the thing I showed before. Um, it looks a bit more extensive, that's because I also added some labels to actually find the, the pods uh, for service definitions and, and so on. Um, um, the pod life, so this is where it actually gets interesting. Um, so you have your containers, uh, your, your, your pods, they are scheduled on, onto your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and um, yeah, what do, what does the pod environment actually look like? Uh, how is it? This is the part where the developers hopefully wake up. This is what you see in your uh, uh, pod environment. So you'd have a bunch of uh, uh, environment variables. Um, uh, a bunch get uh, set by default, like. Uh, the <coughs> The neighboring services and service is another primitive within Kubernetes, which is used to find other pods. Uh, and uh, you actually get uh, all the services in. So, uh, in this example, I would have an open LDAP service within uh, uh, within the same namespace, and you'd get all these environment variables, so different ways of finding. Uh, I think this is quite similar to Docker Compose, right? They, they said the same variables, I think. Does anyone know? I, I don't use Docker Compose. Yeah, yeah. similar. It's quite similar, right? So it, you'd get this bunch of environments for all the neighboring services within the same uh, namespace. Um, I'm not talking about all this other stuff because then uh, I, wouldn't, I would really run out of time. So you can also set some variables yourself, of course, like you would normally with your container uh, thing. You can set... Um, just regular container environments, and this is simple, right? You can also set your environments from um, a shared uh, config. So within your namespace, you would actually have, um, so for DDY, I have a, a DDY params. Uh, I can set the uh, log level for the entire uh, environment. So I would, I would have uh, like eight containers running within the, uh, uh, within the application namespace. With just uh, one Kubernetes primitive, I can set the log level for the entire application uh, uh, environment. So multiple applications, like we probably have uh, like thousands of microservices, right? Because this is what we're running. And then do it centralized uh, within one config node. Um, same, uh, you can do uh, secrets. Actually, quite similar to uh, uh, the config map, except that uh, secrets are uh, base uh, 64 encoded, so you can actually put binaries into a secret, like uh, uh, private keys and so on. Uh, actually,
Actually, I don't like sharing secrets over environment variables. Does anyone know why? Anyone who's a developer, preferably? Nobody? Okay, so applications tend to you know, uh, dump their environment when they wrap themselves. I don't want secrets in there. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, there's uh, other primitives that can, that can be used. Um, Kubernetes also has this metadata service where you can uh, set um, environment variables uh, depending on the actual pod uh, uh, parameters, like the, the name, the, ID, the namespace in which it's living. Uh, you can also mount volumes into your uh, pod, and this is where it gets interesting with Kubernetes because these simple things like empty there, which is just uh, creating some ephemeral data store where you can share like your file pooler with your file server. Uh, you can do a host path, which is actually mounting something on your node because the node is ephemeral and doesn't really care. But you can also mount in sockets like uh, the Docker daemon socket, so you have access to the Docker daemon from within your mount. You can mount in secrets, and this is what I want people to do if they share secrets with their container. Because then you can actually read from the file system and then uh, not have to expose uh, secrets um, in the environment. And there's like these cool persistent storage. Things. So you can actually run a database within a, a pod and have it, you know, store the data and come back on another node uh, and, and still have your database, which is nice. Uh, and Kubernetes is growing fast in support of different volumes. So uh, you probably are running on top of one of these and they support it. Um, mostly well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's also the Kubernetes default services account, which is used to talk to the actual uh, Kubernetes master from within the pod, so you can do all kinds of stuff, cool stuff within Kubernetes, like auto-scaling yourself from a sidecar container. Um, yeah, this is something uh, I, re I really want developers to know about. So health checking. Um, I want health, health check endpoints for everything. Um, the, the liveness probe within Kubernetes uh, actually kills the pod and restarts it. Uh, and is run from the node itself. So not by a master or anything, a centralized entity, it's run on the node to the pod. So it's very local and the node can actually make the decision itself to restart the pod. And um, yeah, you can, you can set some normal uh, parameters for the health check. Um, not every container scheduler has this. Uh, and that's very, really disappointing. I'm not going to name names, but there are some really big names that, that don't do this, and that's really surprising. Um, yeah. Do this, if you don't have a health check, you do not get scheduled on the cluster query. Because then the only health check I have is, is the process to run, which is just really good. Um, readiness checks are a cool feature within Kubernetes. This actually doesn't kill the pod, but schedules it uh, or uh, doesn't add it to the service load balancer. So this is pretty straightforward, but also uh, I think a uh, quite powerful primitive. So you can actually have the pod check if all its backing services, like the database, the cache, and so on, are available, other applications, um, and only then uh, respond with a, a healthy check. And it gets added to the load balancer. And the Kubernetes load balancer is service load balancer is actually a distributed load balancer. So the load balancing actually hands, uh, happens on every node. So that means it's really scalable. Uh, again, unlike most of the other schedulers. Uh, you can also do the same with the liveness probe. You can do uh, XX. So you can actually execute a command inside the container to make sure that the container is still healthy. 
And then, then there's also the more simple thing, which I think is quite useless. See if a TCP socket is still up and running, which is mostly meaningless. If you're going to do objects, do do them correctly. <coughs> Uh, yeah, sure. You, you can make your application have some kind of flag, and uh, only then just like, turn all the instances immediately on. But the immediate part is just uh, something like uh, the checking interval. So, so it wouldn't be immediately anyway. But yeah, you can do it. Um, Kubernetes pods also live in a class society, and uh, what I mean is not every pod is created equal. Uh, you have uh, actual quality of service thing uh, within Kubernetes. Right now, it's only bound to uh, CPU and memory, but you can also do. Uh, they're they're planning on adding like uh, network quality of service, so you can uh, have a pod request some kind of base resource level, and the pod would only get scheduled on the nodes that actually have this uh, kind of resources uh, guaranteed available. Uh, and then there's the limits which, in which you can say, well, the pod is, has requested this, but it can you know, like double its usage. But this is where you get into the you know, overbooking phase, and this is where pods can actually uh, you know, choke each other. So you have to be a, a bit conservative about this, depending on your, your taste for, uh, for Maya. Um, there's also a security context uh, uh, parameter on pods. You can uh, set SE Linux uh, uh, flags on, on, on the pod, so you can add and remove uh, SE Linux uh, things. You can add and remove uh, Linux capabilities. So normally they get scheduled with the uh, default Docker Linux capabilities, I think. But if you want to run something like uh, OpenVPN or something, uh, that actually needs to create a, a network device. So uh, you need to add, add a net admin uh, capability to the pod. And uh, lastly, this is a fairly new feature. You can do uh, CNI, so a container network interface. Uh, most people run uh, Kubernetes with a built-in uh, overlay network or something like Flannel. Um, but this means that every pod can access every other pod on all ports, which is probably not something you want, depending on your environment. Uh, I know I don't want it here. Um, so you have these new overlay networks that can actually read uh, pod properties and uh, you know, in a pod property, you'd set, uh, well, this type of pod can access these types of databases, and then only those pods can, it's, it's a distributed firewall, but it's a fairly complex one. Uh, you can use stuff like Weave or uh, uh, Kaliko is the open source uh, thing. Um, cool stuff happening in this part, but not quite production ready yet. It's a little bit complicated. So. Uh, yes, yeah. Containers die, they die all the time. Um, but uh, what's really important to remember about this is if you schedule mu multiple containers within the same pod, um, if one of them dies, uh, or if, they, if the pod is scheduled to die, then they must all die. Uh, individual containers can be restarted within the same pod, but um, if something like a health check fails, then all the containers within the pod get killed and the pod gets rescheduled. Um, yeah, uh, also you can set like some some number of seconds for your pod to clean up for itself, uh, you know, close some descriptors or whatever. Uh, there's a couple of causes for uh, for pod termination. Uh, one is just 
retirement. Your pod gets replaced by a newer version of your app, and uh, the pod gets a kill signal, gets some time to clean up, and a new pod is scheduled, added to the load balancer, and nobody's the wiser except that your boss is happy that you deployed a new version. Um, you can also do node maintenance, which just marks every pod within some node uh, as unavailable. That's also relatively safe because obviously you handled uh, pod termination within your application. Um, of course, because we're running in cloud, some stuff also happens with other stuff. Like if you have the out of memory killer, just to the Linux favorite. Um, this thing still happens within pods if you don't set limits on every pod because well, there's only so much shared resource and if you don't have like uh, uh, guarantees with uh, uh, QoS uh, uh, requests and pods can uh, extend their bounds, then yeah, the out of memory killer will just kill some pod that's not in a guaranteed class. Uh, and uh, yes, pods also die of natural causes, which means whatever. I mean, uh, nodes just just disappear, and uh, you should be dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, and we're going to through things really quickly in the forum. In the end, I, I just wanted to talk about some some uh, deployment patterns. Um, so Google has been doing this kind of stuff for a long, long time, um, 15 years. If I and Kubernetes is of course obviously made by Google. It's designed after their uh, previous uh, container schedulers. Um, and over the years, they they had this this pod uh, uh, concept already. Um, and some patterns started evolving. So I want to show you three of these patterns that, uh, that they started using uh, or started seeing in the wild by their developers and uh, how you could use these primitives or these, these patterns for your own applications. So first one is the one I showed in the beginning. You have your file puller and uh, file server and the file server would actually only have read only access to the file Puller would have really wide access to the uh, thing. And this is what they call a, a, the sidecar container. It's doing nothing but uh, extend and enhance another already existing application. So, like replacing files underneath the uh, actual file serving uh, container. Um, and this means you can just swap out your Apache container for something cooler like Nginx or you can just because you made this git sync uh, container, which is really simple, you can just plug it into almost anything. And you get these really strong components that get tested throughout your landscape, and I think that's a really good pattern to follow. Um, so yeah, you can hook it up to whatever you want. Um, Secondly, there's the ambassador uh, pattern. This is basically uh, having two containers again within the same pod. The containers can talk to each other over localhost. And uh, the example I'm showing here, uh, yeah, it's not getting good. Um, so what I'm actually, what this is, is a, a proxy. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's a, a Redis proxy server made by Twitter, uh, which is uh, pretending to be Redis, but actually talking to a backend cluster of X number of uh, Redis servers. And uh, your, your Redis app just has to talk to localhost Redis, and the, the ambassador uh, and proxy thing uh, would handle all the other stuff. And um, this is again a very strong pattern. Normally, you'd have to, you know, embed this within your uh, uh, really? within your Docker container. But now you can have this this proxy uh, container that, that you can test uh, and, and make very general. Uh, then you have the adapter pattern. This is the third. Um, the 
ambassador pattern, uh, yeah, it says on the top, normalize and abstract. So you again have your Rails app, and you'd have a container that would just you know, monitor your whatever app. So uh, here you have your uh, yeah, adapter container, the metrics container, that would actually collect the metrics and uh, expose it to your metrics collecting thingy, which would be Prometheus here. Um, in order to, to have a generalized uh, API for your, uh, for your metrics. Um, yeah. It's also, I think, important to note, because um, we're talking about Google here, and these, these patterns uh, develop within a company that's at a massive scale, and they buy companies all the time. And they really, they are the cloud hosters, they're, they're really careful about data, somehow. So what they, the first thing they do is, they say, oh, give us your apps, and they containerize it. They, they, for years they have the, let me contain that for you uh, binary, which would put some stuff, at first they would put it in a change roof thing. Uh, but it's all aimed to quickly have something up and running in their own platform. And then they just have a translation thing, and that's where they, their apps would talk to. So, say you have this le big, big legacy application, or not big, but you have your legacy application, and you you want to expose it to your own um, infrastructure, and all you need to do is write this uh, translation library. And, um, uh, yeah. It's also for security, of course, because then you don't need to expose the legacy application. You don't know what's what kind of code there's running in there. Uh, and you can uh, have some kind of shaming layer. I think that we're not all at that size, but uh, I think it's a powerful concept again. Uh, yeah, this is a small... Uh, <coughs> uh, who's here heard of packet piece? Uh, most of you probably heard of the ALK stack, Elasticsearch, Station, and so on. So what Packetbeat is, uh, is uh, something they acquired, uh, I think, last year, two years ago. Uh, what it's doing is basically doing packet captures uh, and exposing uh, or interpreting the packets. So if it's like HTTP, it will parse out the headers and the, the HTTP body and will actually send it off to uh, Elasticsearch or some kind of uh, caching layer in between. So, uh, a little while ago I needed to debug a, a pod, it was you know, slowly increasing in, in uh, uh, network traffic, but I don't know, didn't really know what it was doing. Uh, and there's actually not a good public uh, Docker container for this, so I just made it myself and it's really small. It's, you can look it up. Uh, and you don't have to use this Docker container. Uh, for Kubernetes stuff, but that's what I made it for. Um, you can quickly add the packet beat container to your existing, well, not to the existing pod, but you can schedule a new pod with the old container and then add it with uh, packet beat. You'd have like uh, very specific packet catchers within this big ass cluster where normally you have to, you know, log into a box and do a TCP dump or whatever kind of <coughs> I think this is a really powerful uh, thing. Um, it's just an example, but this is how you quickly compose something uh, like this. Um, I made it into a quick talk. Um, I also wanted to uh, quickly plug uh, another project I made. Um, um, there is no uh, cube native way of running uh, OpenVPN within Kubernetes, so again I made this one. Uh, it's fairly simple uh, to, to start up. That uh, actually means you can uh, connect into your uh, into your Kubernetes cluster and actually pretend like you're uh, a pod within the cluster. So you can directly connect to your uh, to your pods and um, uh, 
uh, bypass like the ingress controller and all, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to do powerful debugging uh, things, then uh, take a look at this. There's also another small small feature in there. Um, uh, you can actually uh, run back to your laptop. So we have this small problem here where the application stack is growing and growing, and we cannot run the application uh, on the developer laptops soon. <coughs> or at least the entire uh, landscape. So I thought it would be really nice to you know, run like 80% of the applications uh, or 90% of the applications within the cluster, but develop locally because if you want that as a developer, but then how do the other containers you know, run back to your application? Well, they just connect to the OpenVPN pod, uh, which is just doing a nut back to your client. Fairly simple, but uh, I like these powerful small primitives because it makes it uh, so you can move fast. Um, if you think this kind of stuff is cool, uh, yeah, Marcel already talked about it. We're looking for cool engineers to want to do stuff. So, rules gurus or developers, or, um, operations people, and uh, mobile developers. No, no cool name for this because. Uh, Someone neglected to give me a full name for that. Um, so it's there. Um, thanks. If you have any questions, um, please ask them now. I'll be, be available for a bit. Uh, Nobody. <laughs> ah, I did, did really well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you.